Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and today we are bringing on a guest who is, uh, I, 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 she will correct me if I'm wrong here when I say this, but she is looking to run for the leadership of the Alberta Liberal Party here in the province of Alberta, who have just announced their leadership rules earlier this month in June, and she is uh, uh, wanting to challenge some of the rules that have been put into place, and that is Valerie Keefe. Yeah, Keefe, sorry. Keith. I just want Keith, Keith, Keith. I apologize. <laughs> Valerie, thank you so much for doing this. I apologize for screwing up your last name there, but thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about uh, your potential run and what issues you have with the Alberta Liberals' new rules that have been put into place. Uh, well, thank you, Chris. And and don't don't worry too much about getting my name wrong. My political hero is John Beefenbaker, and that guy got his last name mangled constantly. Um, <laughs> Got so, to introduce it stu as Studebaker at one meeting. Anyway, uh, go ahead. <laughs> so, Valerie, I, 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 any any political person that comes on the show, I start off the same line of questions, questioning with the exact same question to everyone. If you're running for office, if you ran for office, you're no exception. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, I mean, I suppose I I could tell the story. I always tell it. It came from when I was five. Um. My my parents' marriage was falling apart, and I was freshly in kindergarten. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do was get time on on the playground. You know, it, it looked like a really fun uh, set of playground equipment. And I found out my first week there that there wasn't a day that the kindergartners could use the playground because it was they wouldn't let everyone play at the same time. You each class had a different day, and the kindergartners didn't come up in the rotation. And I lobbied the teachers. Um, I explained to them, it's like, well, we're only there a half day. You could get, have a share with grade ones. You know, we're, we're kind of small. So it's not like, you know, we're going to get into that much trouble. And they changed the policy. And I think it's the only time in my life that I've had the facts on my side and people in power simply went, okay, <laughs> and did the right thing. Um, my sense of duty, I, I, think, I think we all have to have a, a fundamental sense of fairness and, and openness. And I don't, know, I don't like seeing people get pushed around. Uh, it's happened to me often enough that, that I know what it's like. Um, so so that's, that's what got me started. Um, and, and there have been a lot of twists and turns over the 34 years that I, nearly 34 years now that I've been in public life when you count that kindergartner. Um, so but, what do you mean, but what do, I apologize to interrupt, but I, I've got to ask yeah. the, the, the follow up question because you said fairness and openness. What do you mean yeah. by that? Because people might be listening going, okay, fairness and openness to me might mean something different to Valerie. So for yeah. Valerie, what does fairness and openness mean? Fairness means that you, uh, fairness and openness mean that you have to allow people the right, not just to vehemently disagree with you, not just to strongly disagree with you, but to disagree with you in a style that you might find offensive. You know, George Lorwell said, if liberty is to mean anything at all, it is the right to tell someone that which they do not wish to hear. Uh, something that in the last decade, I think we've lost sight of uh, in the name of keeping people safe, and having a more inclusive society. In fact, it's become less inclusive. We, we end up calling ourselves inclusive merely because we've excluded all of the people whom we've been marginalizing to the point where they express anger at their marginalization, but they don't express it in the right way and in the right frame. And so not only now do we miscontextualize them, which is, you know, been something that is, is as old as, as human existence, but now we, we, you know, we're at the point where we're pseudo criminalizing. Uh, people. I, I can think of an interesting interaction I had in 2018. Um, I mean, I wasn't always openly uh, trans, but uh, so, so, but before then I had participated in a, a gay straight alliance in, in uh, college and well closeted. And I found it a bit alienating. And I had come to see some data that had come out uh, during the, the NDP's push to their Bill 24 that was going to mandate GSAs in all schools. And one of the studies that they include, uh, that's mentioned in the abstract of the study they relied on, actually found that extreme bullying survivors who participate in gay straight alliances are more likely to attempt suicide than extreme bullying survivors who do not. 
Now, I think this is because we are telling closeted people who are disproportionately marginalized compared to other queer pe people that they're, they have a special duty to check privilege over people who have privilege over them. And this is a suicide stressor straight out of Durkheim. But I said this to the wrong person. I said this to a New Democrat staffer, Rick Barnes, his uh, handle on Twitter is Queer Thoughts. So I got a hateful conduct ban. I appealed it four times. I explained I am, in fact, queer, and I am talking about how this institution harms queer people. No, no response. The same boilerplate. Um, so that's when I talk about fairness and openness, I, I'm, I mean the right of all people to say things that, that may offend people, that may seem problematic, that may seem uninclusive because it is how we arrive at truth. And, and truth is inherently good because the, the more that we live in accordance with reality, the, the better the outcomes tend to be. We, we talk about truth a lot and we talk about what, because in today's age of, and I'm using Donald Trump's words here, and I'm, I, I often don't like using Donald Trump's words, but with the rise of fake news, with the rise of uh, what is truthful and the rise of social media and anyone can put their facts out and anyone can, well, anyone can claim what their facts are. How do we bypass that? How do we get to what the truth is in 2022? Because my truth, your truth, if we go on downtown Calgary, downtown Edmonton, we ask 12 different people what their truth is, it's all going to be different. So how do we get to the crux of what is truth? Well, you know, the problem is there's no easy answer there. Uh, <laughs> and and the, people, the people in power want there to be an easy answer. They want there to be, well, if we just erase certain voices and certain ideas and, and call that misinformation, call that denial, we won't arrive at the truth. Democracy is supposed to be an exercise in crowdsourcing, uh, that, that we take everyone's opinion. We don't necessarily balance them all out, but we allow them to be expressed. You have to defend the right of the minority of one to say something which you disagree with, uh, which you may even find harmful to you, to you, because ultimately we don't know who that will ultimately help. Um, and and uh, that's that's we we've completely lost sight of that, and and I think it's fundamentally illiberal uh, that that we have decided that certain perspectives can't be heard, that the same party, um, the, the people currently running the Alberta Liberals, want to ban conversion therapy, but they want to mandate a certain curricula in schools that, once again, I think kills closeted queer kids. You know, And I should be allowed to say that. Not only should I be allowed to say that, someone who, who wants to say that, that all, all uh, sexual minorities are deluded should be allowed to make their argument because sometimes you end up finding the kernel of truth when someone is wrong. Um, I, I remember I ran for parliament in 2004 as a progressive Canadian, because I was a David Orchard delegate and they forced through that, that merger. Um, and, uh, and, and Mr. Orchard unfortunately didn't extract a political price, but, but those of us who were determined to do so did. And I knocked on a door and uh, someone said, I don't like government. Government takes too much of my check in taxes. They take 40% of my check in taxes. And I'm, studying public finance at the time and tax incidents. And I'm like, I guarantee you that's not true. He's like, really? I'll sit you down. And he pulls out his pay stub. And I'm like, okay, that right there is a union due. That's tax deductible. That's a contribution to your private retirement plan. You pay 26%. He goes, well, it's still too high. And for 15 years, the upshot of that for me was, was that it's like, wow, no one will ever be satisfied, no matter how much you cut their taxes. But over time, over hearing other people's perspectives, over hearing uh, labor leader Ed Miliband talk about what he called pre-distribution, I came to realize that he was overtaxed, that we're all overtaxed, but we're not taxed by taxes where the, the government extracts money directly, that we're taxed by regulations that implicitly reward certain parties and keep potential competition away. He was, he, he had his life destroyed by a, a state that was, absolutely pissing away his productivity and, and his, his labor, but not in a way where it would appear on his pay stub. And, and so, you know, nuance and discussion are called for. Um, sometimes you, you need a lot of dumb ideas to arrive at, uh, at a smart idea. I want to turn to the Alberta Liberal Party because this is the reason you're on the show and um, yes. you, you want to run for the Alberta Liberal leadership that is 
currently in a process of electing a new leader after David Kahn stepped down in 2020, 2021. Uh, yeah. There was, a, I think there was a few months there when there was no interim leader. An interim leader was placed, John, I forget his last name. And then- uh, I think it's Rogovin or Rogovin. There I'm, you go. I'll mispronounce that. So reasons I don't feel bad about, <laughs> about starting with Keith. Okay. Um, you you are looking at potentially running for the Alberta Liberal Party, uh, yes. their leadership. Um, first off, I, I've got to start off with uh, some uh, hard hitting questions, and I try not to do the gotcha questions, but I think we've got to here. Um, you come to the Alberta Liberal Party after a brief foyer with the Freedom Conservative Party, which you and I, uh, we emailed before we recorded this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I do my due diligence and try to do as much as little research so that way I can learn about the mm -hmm. guests by them myself. But how does a person who decides to run for the Freedom Conservative Liber uh, leadership then decide to run for the Alberta Liberal leadership? Well, um, you know, I mean, over, over the last decade, I spent uh, a lot of my time and energy uh, fighting for the right of Albertans uh, to purchase hormone replacement medicine, medicine that's safer than aspirin. And in that, I, I tried to find anyone who would listen to me. Uh, you know, Mr. Khan, unfortunately, was unwilling to hold the New Democratic Party uh, accountable because I, I honestly think his interest in having the leadership of the Alberta Liberal Party was more torpedoing Jason Kenney uh, than, than it was in actually uh, pursuing liberal values. And so I was willing to talk to anyone. I got involved with the Freedom Conservatives uh, because a friend of mine, the former deputy leader of the Saskatchewan Green Party, Sheldon Johnson, had referred me to them. And I told them at the outset, well, I will work for you in any capacity you're willing if you will actually hold Rachel Notley accountable on this issue. They didn't do that. They did a very, very long song and dance where they they tried to basically have me run, uh, to declare that I was running so that they could pink wash their, their politics and, and have me as a token. Um, and I was determined to use the internal mechanisms of the Freedom Conservative Party to hold the current leadership accountable and to, to stand up for those values. Um, also, you know, as a lot of angry internet commenters have told me over the last few years, conservatism is just another branch of liberal thought. And they're not entirely wrong. Uh, I, 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 have, I have for about 18 years before this been referring to myself as a left-wing conservative. I, I was, as I mentioned, a delegate for David Orchard. I think that Edmund Burke is quite right that our approach to change has to be a disposition to preserve, but an ability to, to improve, that we know change is inevitable, uh, but that we shouldn't embrace it for change's sake and that we need to understand that change has to build on the previous institutions and principles that we had in society. So I, that's that's why I don't think that that's incompatible. Um, why the liberals now? Well, you know, hopefully to make them liberal again. But what does well, liberal hopefully. mean, though? What does liberal mean? Because as a self-described left-wing conservative, which I've never heard that term until like five minutes ago, um, what what does it how what is a liberal value to a left-wing conservative? Yeah, well, a liberal value is the state as the guardian of the public's rights. The liberal value is a commitment to representative democracy. And that doesn't just mean the rule by the majority, but it means the rights of the minority have to be fiercely protected, something that we have seen this prime minister is very unwilling to do. Um, liberal liberal means, means fundamentally a, a, a commitment to a framework in which the society understands that the individual is the most important political unit. I, uh, I remember when I suspended my Freedom Conservative Leadership Campaign, I opened the speech where, where I did so with a quote from Felix Frankfurter. He said, in a democracy, the highest public office is that of citizen. And I, I was running for a demotion until noon, uh, noon on the 13th, so noon two days ago. But apparently, I'm not allowed to run or campaign until such time as someone ponies up $6,000. It's, it's, uh, it's really interesting, the structure of the, the, the leadership rules. It's, uh, I, I had reached out to the party president about a month before this came out and expressed my interest in, in running. And, said, and they were like, oh yeah, we're just gonna finalize some stuff at the board meeting uh, tomorrow. And I, I'm like, okay, I'll call you back in three days and we can touch base. And I called back and they wouldn't pick up. And I called back again and they wouldn't pick up. And I sent a series of emails and they wouldn't respond other than to say, we're coming out with rules. 
these rules are the anybody but Mallory rules of the leadership election. They are absolutely as the freedom conservative leadership was because they broke their own constitution. Uh, they, they were required to hold a leadership election 360 days from Derek Fildebrand's resignation. They did no such thing. They, they went on for about 15 months after his resignation, first with an interim leader and then an engineered merger. The establishment is that afraid of me. So um, what, do you, what do you mean by it's the any, anyone but Valerie rules that the Liberal Party has, uh, the Alberta Liberal Party has put into place? Because that's a heavy yeah. statement to say. So I've got to ask, uh, I, I, what, what do you mean by that? And so that way my listeners know how yeah. to sort of collate what you're talking about to the rules that have put in place because i've read the rules uh, you and i chatted beforehand and mm -hmm. i read through the document that they released um i i don't know you that well i've done my research on you so why do you say mm -hmm. it's the anyone but valerie rules that have been put out well first of all um they they have established what they refer to as a green light committee who is responsible for uh having the candidates uh, answer a questionnaire, which will be submitted to the leadership co-chairs, who will then decide if someone is able to run. Uh, the, the, the argument behind this is always, well, we have to vet someone. We have, we have, to, we have to see whether or not they would be fit for office, whether they, they reach the, the moral standing required. And again, in a democracy, that's supposed to be the citizens. In a, part, in a democratic party, that's supposed to be the membership. This is literally how Iran runs elections. They're quite certain their regime will always stay in power because they never have someone who is fundamentally opposed to their regime seeking power. Um, that is that is that is step one. You know, effectively, the executive is appointing someone who will appoint someone who will then tell the someone the executive appointed whether or not that someone can run and submit themselves to the membership. Um, that's that's step one. I mean, that that alone is fundamentally offensive, and, and I don't think anyone who comes up with that sort of rule for a leadership election uh, has any business continuing to to administer a political party to, to um, play devil's advocate though isn't that mm -hmm. every political party because the conservatives the conservative party of canada has a green light lit light commune uh committee as well which the all the conservatives had to put forth their names and then they have to be vetted and then they have to raise their money they have to sign up their members so isn't that all political parties in Canada? It just seems very like suspicious that uh, you want to run for the Liberals and you're just calling out the Liberals. Isn't couldn't that be said for all? I'm not all, calling all, out the Liberals. I'm calling out the Liberal executive. You that, know, well, that's the, what I mean. The, couldn't that be yeah, said for all executives across the political spectrum here? Because no. I don't know the internal workings of yeah. the Freedom Freedom Conservatives, so I don't know if there was an actual green light committee for them as well. Well, they were they were trying to establish one after they realized I was running. Uh, this is this is one of those after the horse is bolted um, issues. But but then they simply decided not to hold one. The Freedom Conservatives, that is. Um, you're right that it's standard and it's wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. It's 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 not in keeping with the uh, with the principles to which to which any party that that calls itself democratic should be. Uh, keeping you know if, if you claim to care about canadians or albertans you have no business doing this uh and and you know you're quite right you know there's a lot of there's a lot of things which are standard which uh you know are, are currently happening right now in this very neoliberalized system which didn't used to happen by the way you know there there was no internal green light committee when pierre elliott trudeau became leader of the of the uh, liberal party of canada and by the way there was also no green light committee when i ran for the uh, libertarian uh, leadership federally. I ran for the, the leadership of the Libertarian Party of Canada, finishing third or sixth. And there it was, someone nominates you from the floor, you can run, you know, and and that's something that, you know, if, if we're actually to defend liberal values and the rights of the individual should be standard, uh, that, it, that it isn't is a sign of how corrupt things are. And the same things happened, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, one of the successor, the successor party of the Freedom Conservatives, the Wild Rose Independence Party, um, the, the leader draws a salary that is so substantial that it is effectively bankrupting the party. And I told Mr., uh, I, I mentioned this to Mr. Hinman, and he said, well, you know, it's standard that they, they pay the leader. I wasn't expecting to get paid, um, but, but Mr. Hinman was. And I was like, I understand it's standard, I also don't think you understand how few voters understand that it's standard and how many voters think it's wrong, uh, because it is. Just, just because it's the way we do things doesn't mean it's okay. 
You know, we used to we we used to for nearly 50 years have it be standard that people whom the province of Alberta thought were not fit could be sterilized by the state. That was wrong. Now we do it in neoliberal fashion. You know, we have the Honorable Rachel Notley and the Honorable Jason Kenney spending public money manipulating trans Albertans, mostly women, into sterilizing genital reconstruction surgery by holding them in crisis and denying them access to reproductive medicine safer than aspirin. But that's another issue. <laughs> Sorry, can you clarify that? Because I, 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 yeah. I, I you, you said that earlier on. And I just need some clarification on what you mean by that, because that's a heavy accusation that you're leveling there. And yeah. I just want to make sure that I understand and my listeners understand what you mean by uh, uh, they're putting the, the lives in danger of some people. Yeah, not just the lives in danger, but, but yes, doing it and doing so to to coerce uh, a sterilizing surgery that, that isn't associated with a reduced risk of death, but in fact, increased risk of death. So here's the situation. If, if you want estrogen in Alberta and you are female assigned, you know, if the doc slapped you on the butt when you were born and said it's a girl and you agree um, and you go to your doctor, your doctor is basically going to prescribe it because it's a very low contraindication medicine that has a good degree of efficacy and not a lot of side effects. You know, there's a couple things you might want to watch for. Slightly increased risk of some cancers while you decrease risk of other cancers you know, maybe an elevated blood clot risk. But it, it seems over the last two years, we're not all that concerned when someone talks about a blood clot risk about a medical intervention. Um, if you're trans, my experience was, and the experience of most Albertans, unless they happen to have someone who will, uh, who, who will negotiate the system for them more rapidly, is your doctor will refer you to a psychologist who after some time will refer you to an endocrinologist all for the same medicine with the same contraindications, in fact, fewer contraindications and with greater efficacy in, in terms of improving mental health and reducing risk of death. Not only is this wrong, it egregiously violates the Canada Health Act. And the reason that it is pursued is to my mind from a, a fundamentally offensive notion that to be a woman is to be a cis woman, is to be someone with a vagina and therefore we must surgically construct one, uh, apparently at public expense. Never mind the fact that this causes queer people to be disproportionately less likely to reproduce. Um, here's another interesting statistic that, that adds to that, that you know, speaking of those, those those wrongs adding up to a right. Someone says, well, I don't think the, that uh, homosexuality is natural because homosexuals can't reproduce. Well, it's, it's interesting because uh, National Gay and Lesbian Task Force in the United States in 2011 found that most trans people are attracted to their own sex. Most There are more trans lesbians than there are straight trans women. 29% lesbian, 23% straight, 31% five pan. The rest was a grab bag of other uh, responses and identities. Um, I want to turn back to the Alberta Liberal Party because that's why you're here. And I want to want to flesh this out a lot more. Um, you, you, the honest question would be, if the Liberals won't let you run for leader, why not just go start your own party? Because, and I'm assuming you've probably heard that. And, and I'm not trying to make that a joke. It's just, um, for the hassles, because you told me a little bit about what your what the challenges that you have the um, the issues you have with the executive and the green light committee and the party in general with how they're going to run their leadership race. Wouldn't the natural progression just to say, okay, if the liberals won't change their ways, I'm going to go start a truly liberal party that is democratically uh, a more uh, party aligned to what my morals and beliefs are. And instead of trying to change the party that you're a member of. Yes. Well, because, well, quite, quite simply, it, you just said that at the end, because I'm a member of the party, because I don't believe that the executive is the party. And I frankly don't think that most people who are electing members of the executive thought the executive felt they were this empowered to uh, create barriers to an open democratic process uh, when they were electing them in the first place. You know, the, this this is what's been happening over the last 50 years is people become demoralized by corruption in the system and they leave the system. They 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 opt out. They they become what Tim Moen, the leader of the libertarian previous leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada called withdrawers. But the problem with that is 
that effectively it is it is ceding territory to people on by virtue of their bad behavior. I don't intend to reward people who behave this way by letting them have their way because they're not the party. And I'm going to convince in my capacity as an individual member of that party and potentially in future as a candidate um, that, that they have behaved in a manner that is at, uh, is, is at fundamental variance with the, uh, with, with the principles of their party. The first principle of the Alberta Liberal Party is equality of opportunity. That's their first principle. And here they are basically saying, you know, equality of opportunity, so long as you're already well connected to someone who can, you know, uh, bundle $6,000 in contributions for you to get you started, then, then equality of opportunity. Equality of opportunity, so long as, you know, uh, the people that we appoint think, that, uh, the people that the executive appoints think think that uh, that, you, that you might be a, a good fit and that uh, you share our morals. So not really equality of opportunity. Um, they, they're in violation of fundamental party principles. And so I'm not going to let them defraud the other members of the Alberta Liberal Party uh, without a fight. And, and, and that's why. Um, do you have members of the Liberal Party, the Alberta Liberal Party? I say the Alberta Liberal Party because the the, the federal cousin mm -hmm. has. I, I'm assuming there's not much uh, overlap right now there. Um, do you have members of the Alberta Liberal Party who are supporting you in this uh, uh, challenge that you have against the executive and the rules that have that they have put in place for, around the Liberal leadership? It, well, it's been fairly recent, so I haven't been able to talk to a lot of established members. I have talked to previous members who who uh, are actually were considering rejoining when they heard that I was running. Though so, uh, apparently, once again, I must specify per the rules of the leadership election. Uh, I am I am not at present a, a candidate, uh, though the party executive has has at present not responded to my attempts to get them to define uh, what campaigning actually is. So I don't know if to get nominated, I could invite people down for a pints and politics event somewhere and then solicit donations. They don't want the process to be very transparent unless it's someone who they already think would be a good fit. And this is not the party, this is the people who have captured the party. And, uh, and just like, just like with, with, with any institution, if it's captured, it can be uncaptured. You, you talk about a potential uh, candidate that the executive might want. Um, mm -hmm. While you are the first person that I know of, and I'm very politically astute when it comes to what's happening in the world of politics in Alberta, um, you, you are you saying that there is a potential other candidate out there that the executive might want uh, more than you, or are you saying that they they're, are they're looking, desperately they're... searching for them? Oh, okay. <laughs> that's that's what I'm saying. They're, okay. they're trying very very hard to find them. It's interesting. The candidate search committee in the rules is the only committee that does not have. Uh, a stated obligation to be uh, fair and and unbiased, but I, again, this whole this whole process is is unfair and and biased. It is it is like tr Fox News. They're trademarking it as fair and balanced. Meanwhile, they're also even requiring uh, all all those who submit a nomination package to, in writing, explicitly uh, disavow any right to to sue them in any court. In, in the country um, or any other adjudicative body for that matter. So good choice of language because say if you happen to discriminate against someone who was saying that your policies were hurting trans women uh, because you didn't want the, that, that trans woman to, to potentially run, you wouldn't want to have to deal with an Alberta human rights case saying that you were being discriminated against on the basis of your sex orientation or gender identity. <laughs> what, where do you go from here? Because my, my, my initial reaction is by speaking out, by talking about this, you're hurting your cause of potentially getting them to change their ways. And you, you said it, you're one person, you're hoping to get the rules changed so that way the executive is more democratic in your words. Are you concerned by coming on this show, by speaking out via social media, by speaking out, um, you might even hurt your chances even more to potentially be a candidate and see those rules overturned? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm too reflexively honest to shut up long enough to ever make a deal with with, with people who will behave this way. So so while, while that, that may in fact be the case, um, I, I, don't, I don't think it would be something I'd be particularly successful at. 
Uh, secondly, since they haven't responded to numerous attempts at communicating with them over the past month, uh, I don't think they're open to a deal, which is is why they they are trying to run this very, very quick uh, election. They claim it's over four months, but the deadline for memberships is already less than three months away. The vote is happening three months and and uh, less than two weeks away. So, you know, some fuzzy math there uh, to quote another president I'm normally not fond of quoting. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, what, what the path forward is, uh, it's probably going to be, it, it's, it's probably going to be this. Um, we, I need to demonstrate to the membership exactly how little respect the executive has for the membership of this party and for, for that matter, their own rules. Um, it's said that there is a two week process by which I must be informed in writing should there be an expulsion. Speaking of things the Freedom Conservatives did, they ignored their own process with respect to expulsion because I had been expelled in 2018 over a, a, an a candidacy announcement I made because I was trying to get Mr. Fildebrandt to clarify his position on hormone replacement. Uh, they, they ignored their constitution then. I wanna see exactly um, how willing these people are to follow their own rules. Speaking of things that are a, a fundamental aspect of fairness, you have to play by the rules that you expect others to play by um, if, if you're going to be fair. Uh, I, I, I may be hurting my chances of winning this particular uh, biased vote. I do not think that they will change these rules. Uh, I do think that part of any leadership campaign that I may in future, may in future, this is so ridiculous, um, be a part of would include a, a wholesale uh, reform of the Constitution. But I can tell you, as a member of the Alberta Liberal Party, I will be seeking the removal of every single member of this executive. Um, they have no business governing this party if they are to behave this way. This is this is fundamentally illiberal. And, and so it, it's convenient, I guess, because Initially, I thought uh, campaigns are a mechanism of, of engagement and persuasion, and and I thought that a leadership campaign would be the ideal uh, means of talking to other Alberta liberals about why the party had its worst finish in the last election since Confederation. Um, now we don't just have that; we have an internal reform movement. Now, make liberals liberal again doesn't have to be the slogan of a leadership campaign. Now it can be the uh, means by which a party attempts to reform itself and once again put the individual member where they need to be, uh, which is at the head. <laughs> I guess I should have asked this question to begin with, but liberal in Alberta is sometimes a dirty word <laughs> with, uh, with Justin Trudeau and I and love him or hate him. And anyone who's listened to the show knows uh, I ran for the Liberals in 2015 up in Peace River, Westlock. So I've never kept that a secret. Um, it, maybe not the party for me right now, but um, <laughs> why, why is the Liberal Party, the Alberta Liberal Party, the best party to lead this province right now? Well, right now they're not. Um, take take away the executive. Why, mm -hmm. why would people change their tune around uh, looking at the Alberta Liberals as more than just the Liberal Party? Because let's be mm -hmm. honest, if you, you, put your, you slap the Liberal logo on something, there are many people in this province who would turn their nose at that. So why is the Liberal Party the party that should be looked at as a potential option again? Well, because... Our principles are the principles that, that most Albertans resonate with. We do want equality of opportunity. We do, we do want a market economy. We, we, we do understand that environmental stewardship means that you can't just reduce, uh, re reduce the world to GDP statistics because, you know, as uh, Robert F. Kennedy Sr. said, uh, GDP measures everything except that which makes life worth living. Um, that, that our party and our party membership, I think, I think understand and, and have, especially after a long time out of office, uh, much more of a respect for the stubborn dignity of the, the individual. It, it's also worth noting that, that, that those who have uh, a, real, a real problem with Prime Minister Trudeau, and, and so do I, I often tell people I'm pro-Pierre and anti-Justin uh, when it comes to, to the Trudeau family, that, that this, this uh, 
an entitled child as, as a narcissistic child as, as Jordan Peterson might describe him uh, is the exact opposite of everything his father fought for and achieved. Pierre Elliott Trudeau fought for individual rights and restrained government and and for that matter Canadian ownership of the oil and gas industry and lower gas prices. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded now with gas prices as high as they are. I used to work overnights at a Petro Canada in 2004 gas prices hit what was then the shockingly high price of 70 cents a liter and everyone would come up to me uh, at night and they'd be like why is the price of gas so high. As though I was plugged in as a, as, a, as a gas station clerk about that. I was plugged in, however, as an economist uh, who understood history. So I'd go, well, did you vote liberal in 1984? And they went, well, no. Well, that would be why. We don't have a national energy program anymore. Um, I, I, think, I think it's because if we stop, and, and this, was, this was one of the serious problems I had with Mr. Khan's leadership, is, is that his argument was that liberals fundamentally agree with New Democrats um, and, and simply argue over, over policy minutia. I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think that the New Democratic Party has different policy assumptions, that they view things through a class lens, that they uh, refuse to see the degree to which uh, they are privileging members of those classes themselves. Um, and, and, and as someone who, who once was a member of that party, yeah, um, I, I, think, I, I think that the way in which we, we convince Albertans that uh, we're worth governing is to find, uh, that, that we're worth looking at as a governing option is to finally act like one and, uh, and to, and to op, uh, offer voters a, a real fundamental change as opposed to incremental change and just being a little bit different. I, I think that's the case with any party that's not, you know, either in government or the opposition. Uh, after, after my libertarian leadership run, uh, uh, a, um, a member of the legislature who's very libertarian sympathetic is like, why haven't they won yet? It's like, well, we're still kind of full of shit. Voters won't, voters will pick a third party option if they're not full of shit, but they won't pick a slightly less full of shit third party option. They're not going to throw everything overboard that we currently have uh, for, for only a minor, a minor change. Or to quote Saul Alinsky, the, the middle class will only start playing when, uh, when they have at least three aces in the game of revolution. Um, to, to kind of wrap this up, because we're almost at the 40 minute mark here, and I just want to make sure I get this in. Mm -hmm. This is a battle that has just started because we are recording this two days after uh, the leadership roles were announced. And yes. um, I'm assuming this is not a done issue for you because you are, no. you are going to be challenging this and you're hoping to get a resolution that is beneficial to you. What if you don't? What well, if well, you not don't? even beneficial to me. I, well, you know, it can be beneficial to democracy. I, I just, I, uh, my, my role ever since I was that five year old on the playground is when I win, you win. Yeah. Um, but and and so so I would benefit by by a more open and democratic party. But what's what's in the cards for me? Well, um, I will be involved in this leadership vote in one capacity or another. I will be continuing to hold the executive accountable. I will fight for their removal at the next convention. I will, uh, if they expel me, I will sue. And I will sue alleging discrimination on the, on the grounds I've mentioned already, because I will not be waiving my right to sue, uh, to, to sue in, any, in any context except a leadership vote. And, and even that under duress, because I think that's fundamentally wrong for a party to be doing. Um, I'm in this for the long haul. You know, until the, the only reason I wasn't still in the in the Freedom Conservative Party is they destroyed their own party uh, rather rather than than engage with me. And I'm not a separatist. You know, if if the principles of the party change such that, that separation from confederation becomes a fundamental uh, value of the Alberta Liber Liberal Party, then I would consider ceasing to be a member. But uh, I'm not going anywhere. They're, they're stuck with me. They, they uh, just don't know it yet. Um, Valerie, uh, how can people learn more about uh, potentially if you decide if the party lets you run? How can people get in contact with you? Is there ways that people can reach out and talk to you and help you uh, potentially change? Because there might be a liberal listening to this and say, you know what? Valerie's right. We need to change the rules and we need to have voices at the table and we need to have a democratically run leadership race. So how can people get in contact with you? 
Well, um, I mean, if they want to to let the Alberta Liberal Party know, they can tell them at 780-414-1124 uh, or through their website, which I think is albertaliberal.ca. Um, they can also find me on social media at minds.com slash Valerie Keith, all lowercase. We're working on some other socials as well. Uh, as well, they can reach me via phone because I always love talking to people. I mean, we could go on for a few more hours. You, I'm a talker. Uh, but uh, they can reach out to me via phone at 587-785-2727. Awesome. And for anyone who's listening or watching this, uh, the links to those will be in the show notes. So hypothet like if you want to reach out, Valerie it loves to chat, as she just said. Um, I would mm -hmm. continue chatting. It's just I have other interviews that I have to do today. So I want to make totally. sure I get to them. Valerie, um, thank you so much for coming on and being honest and being blunt and being uh open to this conversation because sometimes uh, I know it's hard for some people to realize, but uh, when you speak out, sometimes things do change. So thank you for willing to even speak out about this and coming on the show to talk about this. Thank you, Chris. And, and it was a pleasure. Um, so with that, I want to remind everyone that this has been the cross board interviews with Chris Brown. Uh, get out from behind social media from time to time and go have a conversation with somebody. Uh, In-person conversations actually do help our democracy, it helps our society, and it helps us be better people. Um, fighting on Twitter and fighting on uh, Facebook and social media is not the way forward. Um, just get out and just have a conversation with somebody. Have yourself an excellent day, everyone, and remember, just keep talking.